God and our Father, we give you thanks for your mercy to us. Or to be able to, to be confronted by you through your word is a great mercy to us. We pray that not only will you instruct our minds with the truth that you have revealed to us about ourselves and about you, but that you would convince us and convict us of, of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment that is to come. Grant to us the grace uh, to believe your word, to obey it, to walk before you in, in truth, in righteousness, and cheerful obedience. We thank you for what we learn from the life of Gideon about the nature of our God, about the preciousness of your promises to your people, and about the consequences of our unbelief and disobedience. Lord, speak to us and help your servants to listen. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. As you're taking your seat, will you turn with me to, to Judges chapter 6? Judges chapter 6. We're going to be working through over the next... Hold on just a second. Pardon me. That got tangled up. We're we'll working through Judges 6. Um, Gideon ends up being one of the, it's the longest of the passages so far that we've seen on the Judges. As we've walked through the first five chapters, we've seen several Judges, and there's a great contrast between Gideon and the other Judges that we've seen so far with respect to the length of the narrative describing them. And particularly, we compare it to, you know, lowly Shamgar, who got one verse. And here Gideon has three full chapters, and really four, if we count the, the chapter in chapter 9 that gives the aftermath of Gideon's judgeship, including his own son. So we have this, this account of Gideon that over the next several chapters, we're going to be confronted with perhaps our own weakness of faith. This is really the picture. This is what we see in Gideon over and over again. And sometimes those things that Gideon does are actually wrongly commended to us as, as a practice to be imitated, when in fact what we learn more from Gideon is an exercise of the strength of God, the power of God, in the midst of, and even despite, the weakness of his people's faith, the frailty of our obedience. As I said, it's the longest section so far devoted to any judge, but like all the judges before, Gideon ends up being this complex character. There, there are some things about Gideon that we will, as, over, as we look at chapters 6, 7, and 8 in particular, that we will find praiseworthy, that we'll find commendable. But there are other things that we, we, will, we may even cringe and say, ooh, that shouldn't be. But isn't that the nature of life itself? Isn't that the nature of, of all men of flesh? Mark Twain said, I have no race prejudices. I think I have no color prejudices or caste prejudices nor creed prejudices. Indeed, I know it. I can stand any society. All that I care to know is that a man is a human being. That's enough for me. He can't be any worse. Because as the saying goes, the best of men are men at best. And even as we will find some things about Gideon that are praiseworthy, his life is complex. You know, we, we like to think back to maybe the, the Saturday afternoon shows when we were kids, the Lone Ranger or something like that, when there were white hats and there were black hats. The white hats were always the good guys and the good guys were all good. And the black hats were the bad guys and the bad guys were all bad. But life isn't usually like that, is it? We are complex creatures. We are complex men and women. And even the heroes of our faith, the heroes that we find in the scriptures, the great men and women of faith, were frail. They were men with clay feet, just as ours. And Judges ends up being a good reminder for us not to make idols of men. And we honor faithful men, and we, we ought to honor faithful women. I mean, we praise good virtue. Proverbs 31, the, the woman pictured there is it's said about her that, that even her husband and children rise up and call her blessed. It's worthy of honor. We applaud courage. We applaud trustworthiness. But we should never venerate men. And Gideon's a good lesson in that. I'm going to deal with the text under two headings. And rather than reading, because it's a longer passage, we've got 
some 40 verses. I'm not going to read the text all at one time. We're going to break it into two main sections. In the first section, verses 1 to 24, I want you to notice this multi- multiple ways of divine confrontation. We have divine confrontation. And we'll consider it under that heading. And then in the second half of the narrative, we're going to see Gideon begin to respond. And I'm calling this a section of faltering faith. Those beginning baby steps of true faith. So let's consider these things together. And I'll make some commentaries I'll read through. But let's, I'm going to read in the, first, in the first pass. I'll read verses 1 to 24. So here now, the word of, of the living God. Then... The sons of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of Yahweh, and Yahweh gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. And the power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. And it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would go up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go up against them. So they would camp against them and ruin the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would go up with their livestock and their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to make it a ruin. And so Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh, Now it happened when the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh on account of Midian that Yahweh sent a prophet to the sons of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to my voice. Then the angel of Yahweh came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, And his son, Gideon, was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to preserve it from the Midianites. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. Then Gideon said to him, O Lord, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wondrous deeds which our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Then Yahweh turned to him and said, Go in, go in this strength of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? But he said to him, O Lord, with what shall I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall strike down Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then do a sign for me that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you, and I bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of Yahweh put out the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of Yahweh went away from before his eyes. And Gideon saw that he was the angel of Yahweh. So he said, Alas, O Lord Yahweh, for now I've seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. And Yahweh said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh and named it Yahweh is Peace. And to this day, it is still an Ophrah of the Abiezrites. May the Lord bless the reading of his word and, and encourage and help his people here. Let's notice here, we have this, this episode, this sort of two waves, if you will, of divine confrontation. 
But there is, as I mentioned, this is an expansive, the most expansive narrative we found so far in the book of Judges. It will be surpassed only by the narrative of Samson. But here we have the longer section describing Israel's descent into idolatry. And we, of course, you've seen this cycle. As we've gone through Judges, we've seen it over and over again, where the people of God do evil in his sight. God delivers them over to an oppressor. They cry out to God, and God raises up a deliverer. And here, the, the oppression of Midian is, 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 is seven years, which is shorter than we've seen under Ehud or under the Canaanites, Jabin, king of Canaan, but it is more severe, it's more intense. The Midianites are such a people that they live, they live across the Jordan, on the, on the east side of the Jordan, but they would wait until the crops of Israel would begin to sprout. If you're a farmer or rancher, you know what this looks like. You've, you've planted the wheat, you've, you've planted the harvest, and just the corn, just as it's coming up, someone brings in livestock without number and turns them loose in your fields. And of course, the oxen, the sheep, the goats, the Midianites would love those tender sprouts of the Jews' wheat. And it was a, a period of not only economic hardship for them, but, but terrorism. This was terroristic. They were opportunistic in the way they would come in and send out their livestock without number. The, the men who would come were without number, and the text here describes them as being like locusts. Now, in the ancient world, there's really a few things more fearful than a swarm of locusts. Because the nature of an agrarian economy, we're used to you know, our, our, our food coming from a grocery store. And we're, not used, we're, we're used to being able to get vegetables out of season because we can import them grown someplace else. But this wasn't the way it was in the ancient Near East. You're, you had a little bit of leftover from last year's crops, but you were planning on this harvest to get you through to the next harvest. So when the locusts came, or when, in this case, when herds were driven in to trample your crops, to consume your crops, as if locusts had come, there was no backup. In fact, so severe was the physical threat to them that when, when the band of marauding Midianites would come into the land, the Israelites would quite literally head for the hills. They would go up and carve out these caves and hide there. So that's where we're going to discover Midian. We get to him in a moment. I mean, or Gideon. I said the last night at the dinner table, I'm going to confuse those two at least twice during the sermon. So that's one. You're keeping score. Gideon, not Midian, Gideon was found in a wine press. We'll talk about why that's significant here in a moment. But notice something here. When we're studying Old Testament narratives, when you're studying ancient Near Eastern literature in general, in the, in the Bible in particular, the Hebrew mind, the ancient Near Eastern mind, liked patterns. You know, we tend to emphasize things in other ways, but they would repeat. And sometimes as you're reading through and you get to a genealogy or you get to, you're getting a narrative and things are just repeated over and over again. It's almost, to our, our Western mind, it seems tedious or even tiresome to see things repeated. But often what happens is when you have those patterns established and then the pattern is disrupted, your antenna ought to go up. That ought to get your attention. So we've talked about this before, for example, in Genesis 1 and 2. When days 1 through 5, God says it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. He gets to day 6 with respect to Adam. It is not good that man is alone. Aha, that's a break in the pattern. This is significant. We have a similar break in the pattern. We've seen the pattern. They do, God's people do evil in his sight. God gives them over to an oppressor. They cry out to Yahweh, and then what does Yahweh do? He raises up a deliverer. But we have a break in the pattern here. Notice in verse 7. Now it happened when the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh on account of Midian that Yahweh sent, what would we expect to see if the pattern holds? A deliverer. But what does God send? A prophet. The pattern is broken. That's significant. He sends a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, it was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Yahweh your God. 
You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to my voice. So God comes by way of a prophet and confronts them and says, this is exactly what I told you would happen. In a series of sermons that Moses preached, we have it recorded in our Bibles as the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the second law. And it's, it's a series of sermons Moses preaches to the people, preparing them to go across the Jordan and into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 28, there is a series of curses that God says, this is what's going to happen if you enter into idolatry and take up the practices and the worship of the Canaanites. Listen to, to Deuteronomy 28, verse 29. You shall grope at noonday as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. And he goes on to say, even your oxen will give birth and you'll never see it. Your donkey will be taken from you. There'll be no compensation. The prophet comes and says, you didn't listen to my voice. This is exactly what I said would happen to you. And then we come. So here, the first God first comes by way of a prophet, and he confronts them with his word. Then we're going to see in this next section where the angel of Yahweh comes. And what we're going to find is this is not only an angelic messenger. This is the angelic messenger. This is the the second person of the Trinity. This is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ himself. This is what we know as a Christophany, a pre-incarnate visitation. And, and the language itself and Gideon's response confirms this. But the angel of Yahweh comes and sits under this oak tree. And so here's the scene. And this is, this is somewhat comical. You, you've got to kind of laugh because this this shows to us not only Gideon's sin and folly, but, but our own. Gideon is, is down in a wine press. A wine press would have been excavated out of the, the rock down below the ground. Now, where was wheat normally threshed? Would have been up on a hill. So that as they, 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 they crushed the wheat, they would throw it up in the air, and a slight breeze on a hill would take that chaff far away, and the grain would fall to the ground. After our Tarby Sea meeting this last week, we were staying with Gina's family there in Hillsboro, and it's, it's corn harvesting season. Now, there's not a cornfield within, it's probably, as the crow flies, three to four miles away is the closest cornfield. But we're sitting outside, and chaff starts coming down out of the sky. Some big pieces of corn husk just coming down. And, and what, what happens is when the, when the in, in, the, in the manual practices of threshing out the wheat, they would cast it up in the air, and that cloud could be seen from miles and miles away. And Gideon's thinking, I don't need to be visible with this. We don't want our enemies to know we actually made, managed to get a harvest of some kind, or they'll come and steal it. So he hides down in a wine press, which for threshing wheat's very inefficient. Down in the hole, you don't get the breeze that you need, but you get the security. So the angel comes, and he sits under this oak tree. And he's just watching. We don't know how long he was there. Have you ever been working on something? You have somebody kind of come up behind you, and you just kind of a sense, somebody's, somebody's here. And Gideon turns around, and here's the angel of the Lord. And he greets Gideon with this ironic statement. Yahweh is with you, O mighty man of valor. Gideon's hiding in a wine press. And the angel says, greetings, mighty man of valor. And I think the best way to understand Gideon's response is somewhat sarcastic. He doesn't yet know to whom he speaks. And his response is, is, is somewhat sarcastic. It's even bitter. You, could, you can almost hear this. Oh, my Lord, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Really? Really? If God's with us, why are we in this predicament? Why am I in a hole in the ground threshing wheat if Yahweh is really with us? We've heard, we've heard these tales of what he did for our fathers as he brought them out of Egypt, but where is that? Where is that God? Where is, where is that kind of work among us? And Yahweh turned to him and said, Go in the strength of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And, and I think 
Yahweh is speaking to Gideon and pressing him here and said, if, if, this is, if this is what you want, if this is the self-sufficiency is what you're after, go. Go and deliver yourselves. And Gideon says, oh Lord, with what shall I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest of my father's house. Now this is a fascinating exchange. And from a literary standpoint, this is, this is the word of God. It's describing an event that, that quite literally took place at a point in time in history. And also, it is brilliant literature. Because there is an illusion here, and there's part of this interplay between Yahweh and Gideon is a reminder. See, Gideon brought up Moses and brought up the Exodus and said, where is that? Where is that Yahweh? Where is that kind of presence? So Yahweh says to him, surely I will be with you and you shall strike down Midian as one man. And Gideon says, if now I found favor in your eyes, then do a sign for me that it is you who speak with me. So there's an allusion here to another deliverer that God raised up who also debated with God about his qualifications. Remember Moses. Moses turns aside, and there's a burning bush. And God speaks to him. The angel of the Lord speaks to Moses out of that burning bush. Now, do you remember where Moses was when that happened? He was in the land of Midian. And you know how Moses ended up in the land of Midian? Because he struck down one man. He struck down an Egyptian and had to flee. So, the, so Yahweh is, is actually encouraging Gideon, in a way, to remember that event. And the narrator here in our story is also encouraging us, aha, this is, this is like another deliverer that God raised up against insurmountable odds and led his people to safety. Gideon asked, by what means will I save Israel? Yahweh says, just as he said to Moses, surely I will be with you and you shall strike down Midian as one man. Now, Gideon is, is catching on to the illusion here. He's catching on to the reference. So now he asked, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Moses got a, Moses got a sign. He had a burning bush. What kind of sign do I get? That's what he asked. If now I have favor in your eyes, then do a sign for me that it is you who speak with me. And the angel of the Lord says, okay. Now, this is also sort of somewhat comical. Gideon says, please don't depart from me. Wait here. I'm going to go bring an offering and lay it before you. And then verse 19 describes so quickly and simply something that probably took hours to accomplish. He goes and gets a goat out of the field, slaughters the animal, butchers it, cleans it, cooks it long enough to make broth, builds a fire, breaks bread, cooks the animal. Meanwhile, the angel of the Lord is still there. Now, I will tell you the kids in my house are not that patient while they're waiting on dinner. I'm not that patient waiting on dinner. But the angel of the Lord is accommodating Gideon's weakness. He's accommodating here and patiently enduring the frailty of faith. Simply telling Gideon, I'm the same God who brought your people out of Egypt. I've already proven myself. Shouldn't that have been enough? And, and don't you maybe have something kind of rising up in you right now saying, well, if I'd been there, I would have. No, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. We can so easily overestimate ourselves. But this is always what God does among his people. This is the way. So first through a prophet, and now through Yahweh himself, he comes and speaks. God confronts us through his word. He confronts us. He will not leave us in a pit. He will come in his mercy and press upon us. And we will naturally focus on the external enemy. Isn't that what they were doing? I mean, I would have been doing the same. You would have been doing the same. You're hiding in a cave. You haven't had a good crop in seven years. Your livestock is long gone. And, and now you're focused on that external enemy. But the word of God comes to them and says, you've got a greater enemy you have to deal with. You've got bigger concerns than the Midianites. 
God reminds us of the internal enemy that wages war against us. Divine confrontation through the word of God explains who God really is. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. I am the Lord who said, I will be with you. I am the Lord who said, do not be afraid. And yet here you are, hiding in a wine press, oppressed by your enemies. All the things that I said would happen. God's word exposes who we really are, not how we imagine ourselves to be. God's word confronts us with who he really is, not who we might imagine him to be. So we cry out in in the misery of our hardship. We cry out perhaps due to our circumstances, perhaps due to our sin and the consequences of our sin, perhaps to do to some sin against us and the consequences of that. And we cry out to the Lord. And, And what we want is to see God raise up a deliverer. We want the hardship to go away. We want calm to be restored. And what does God often do to us? He sends us his word. He sends us that prophetical work in us. In his mercy, God sends his word to us. How often have you been struggling with something? Wrestling with a hardship, wrestling with your own sin, wrestling with a hurt, a betrayal, and and you're wanting the pain to stop. And what does God often do? He sends to you a sermon. He sends to you a brother or sister who opens the word of God and reminds you of something important. Or his spirit brings to your mind a precious promise from the word of God. God sends a prophet to you. Not in a tangible sense, there are no ongoing prophets, but the ministry of the word is a prophetical work. And what does God expose? When, and we, we see a pattern that develops within Gideon. Here, in, in, as, as first the prophet, and then Yahweh himself comes, and he exposes his people. But what does he expose in particular? There's three things. One, their idolatry. The first thing is he exposes their idolatry. Secondly, he exposes their sinful fear. And thirdly, he exposes their ignorance and blindness as to what's really going on around them. And each of these points, God demonstrates that the solution is found in himself, in his own person and work. As God confronts the idolatry of his people, we're going to see in the next section how God sends Gideon physically, literally, to tear down an altar to Baal and cut down an Asherah. He confronts their idolatry. And God demonstrates that that the solution to idolatry isn't simply to stop worshiping other gods. It's to worship the true and living God and to worship him alone. As we've been working through in our our worship service, the Orthodox Catechism, we were finishing up the second commandment today and and starting the third commandment. But we were back on the first commandment. What Idolatry. You shall have no other gods before me. The question comes, what is idolatry? We can throw that word around, but sometimes we don't stop and think, what what does it mean to be idolatrous? And the answer is that idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. Idolatry is not only worshiping a false god, but trying to worship Yahweh alongside worshiping something else. And that's what's happening here. And God confronts him in this. He reveals, down in verse 30, if you want to look ahead a little bit, down in verse 30, this reveals just how far into idolatry Israel had gone. This is after, we'll read this in a moment, but after Gideon had torn down the altar, destroyed the altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah, the men of the city wake up the next morning. Who, who did this? And they actually say, bring out your son that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. Now, think about this. This is a complete reversal. As our brother read, from a, read out of Isaiah today, we had a similar phenomenon. The prophet Isaiah said there will be a time when people call good evil and evil good. 
what should have happened to Baal worshipers in Israel under the law. They should have been put to death. But now Gideon's own father is having to defend him publicly because the men of the city are saying whoever tore down Baal's altar is guilty of a capital crime, ought to be put to death. What should have been cause for God's just judgment was now socially mandated. Not only was it, they didn't call just merely for toleration of the worship of Baal, but they wanted to make it mandatory for everyone. So the one who says Baal, worship of Baal as God is virtuous, and the one who says idolatry is sin, is the abomination worthy of death. Does this sound familiar? One says you ought to be put to death for being an abomination to God. The other one says if you call it an abomination, you're the one who has to go. This is a picture of how far into idolatry that the people had descended. And I think, incidentally, that's one of the reasons that this is the longest section so far in the book of Judges describing how the extent of the oppression is because the narrator is showing to us every time the cycle goes around, it gets worse. It gets worse. And it gets even worse. We have an idolatry that can only be replaced by true worship of God. We also have sinful fear. Here's Gideon hiding out. The people of God are hiding in caves. And God says, I commanded you not to fear the people. And yet here you are. You're cowering. You've forgotten that I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. I delivered you from a much greater, more superior army, even than the Midianites. And now you're hiding in fear because you don't believe I'm with you. You don't believe I'm able to deliver you. And God confronts that sinful fear, but what he's confronting them with is they have, a, they have a fear of man, not a fear of God. And God turns this over and says, you need to fear me. You need to reverence me. You need to listen to my voice. That's the antidote to your fear. And we see this, of course, in the New Testament. Paul says, God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. And the prophet reminded God's people, as, as the prophet comes and speaks to his people, he says, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to my voice. He said, I am the one who promised to be with you. And, and God made the same promise to Jacob, for example. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. That's in Genesis 28. I'll just give you a couple examples. Exodus 3. Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you. And then again to Joshua. Joshua's beginning to, to worry as Moses dies and Joshua's given the mantle of leadership. And he says to Joshua, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. This is the promise given to all of us. And the very last words that the, the gospel writer of Matthew records for us is Jesus gives this great commission. Right before he's caught up into the clouds, into heaven, he says, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. But thirdly, here the people are, God confronts through his prophet and by, and by Yahweh himself coming to get and he confronts them in not only their sinful fear, not only in their idolatry, but their ignorance and blindness to what's really going on. And we need this same reminder, don't we? Gideon's hiding out in a wine press thinking the wheat was his biggest concern, thinking that the Midianites were their greatest threat, forgetting that it was the sin that remained in them. It was their own stubbornness, their own rebellion that was by far their greatest threat. God's special revelation comes by, by means of his word rather than by man's self-directed, self-deceived understanding of the world around us. See, we like to think we're pretty smart. We like to think we're wise. I mean, you could read through the book, the Paul's two epistles to the Corinthian church. 
And, and, and hopefully we will all see that as, as a rebuke to our, ourselves and a rebuke to the spirit of our age. Thinks we know everything. We can cultivate this wisdom. We have this special knowledge. We understand the world, how the world works. And God comes to us by means of his word and says, you really don't know half of what you think you do. And there's that famous line from Ronald Reagan, it's not that my liberal friends don't know anything, it's they know too many things that aren't so. And isn't that us? We think we know things about ourselves that aren't so. We think we know things about one another that aren't so. We think we know things about God that aren't so. And we need God, we need that divine confrontation. We need, we need to be confronted and pushed where we are failing to understand. God does not promise, nor does he owe us answers to all of our questions. Brothers and sisters, we, we, we don't continue. We must not continue to fail at the very same points where the Israelites had failed. This idolatry, <laughs> this fear of man rather than fear of God, this ignorance and blindness to the way the world really is, the way God really is, we need regular, we need constant divine confrontation. We need the ongoing prophetical office of Christ speaking to us. In our confession of faith in chapter 8, there's a whole chapter on Christ as in the person of the mediator, the one and only mediator between God and man. And in paragraph 9 in that chapter, it speaks of, of a threefold office that Christ holds as mediator, prophet, priest, and king. And that that office is proper only to Christ, no one else, either in part or in whole, can hold that office, nor can that office be transferred to anyone else. And then the next paragraph says, this number, meaning three, and order of offices, prophet, priest, and king, is necessary, for in respect of our ignorance, we stand in need of his prophetical office. We need Christ to come as a prophet to us. We need him to instruct us and expose to us who we really are, what our true condition is. We need the regular and constant divine confrontation. We, we need the ongoing prophetical office of Christ. So I would submit the question to you, do you seek that out? Or are you devoted to seeking out that sort of divine confrontation? See, our, our, our human instinct, our natural instinct, is exactly what Adam and Eve did. They covered themselves and hid. They didn't want the divine confrontation, but it was actually in that divine confrontation that they found mercy, isn't it? And that's exactly where we find it, when God comes and confronts us. Do you seek, seek out God to explain to you what you were unable on your own to know? What you were unable to discern? Do, do you seek divine confrontation to know God more clearly, to know him more truthfully? And, and, and the scriptures are clear that Christ executes this office of prophet, through his word, and especially as he gathers his people under his word proclaimed and preached. Do you come expecting divine confrontation? Do you expect to come in and be patted on the head and say, that's a good boy, that's a good girl? Or do you expect to be confronted and challenged and pressed so that God can conform you by his spirit's power more and more to the very image of his son? But often, too often, God's people come in just casually, come in unprepared, come in late, come in uh, not expecting to meet with the triune God of heaven. I mean, for some, if you, if you approached your employment, the responsibilities there that you do with the same casual nature you approach worship, you wouldn't last very long as an employee. They would see very clearly, there's not, a, there's not that commitment, there's not that zeal, there's not that drive to improve. We need divine confrontation. We need the prophetical office to come and speak to us. Let's consider the second half. We'll go quickly here. These faltering steps of faith. And we're going to see this theme continue in the next couple of chapters as we examine Gideon. But here we have, beginning in verse 25, now it happened... On the same night that Yahweh said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down the altar of Baal which belongs to your father and cut down the Asherah that is beside it and build an altar to Yahweh your God on top of the stronghold in an orderly manner and take the second bull and offer a burnt offering 
with the wood of the Asherah which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as Yahweh had spoken to him. And now it happened that because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city to do it by day, he did it by night. Then the men in the city arose early in the morning, and behold, the altar of Baal was torn down, and the Asherah which was beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. And they said to one another, Who did this thing? And when they searched about and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever will contend for him shall be put to death by mourning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because someone has torn down his altar. Therefore on that day he named him Jerubael, that is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he had torn down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of Yahweh clothed Gideon and he blew a trumpet and the Abiezrites were called together to follow him and he sent messengers throughout Manasseh and they also were called together to follow him and he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun and Naphtali and they came up to meet them. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it's dry on the ground, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have spoken. And it was so. Indeed, he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, and he drained the dew from the fleece, a full bowl of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not let your anger burn against me, that I may speak once more. Please, let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew on all the ground. And God did so that night. So it was dry only on the fleece, but dew was on all the ground. We see Gideon here receiving the command of God, stepping forward in obedience, but fearfully so. He goes under the cover of darkness. He goes at night to tear down the altar. Uh, Dale Davis says, obedience was essential and heroism optional. There's another reluctant deliverer that we've seen already. Moses receives a sign, and, and Gideon's asking the same kinds of questions, and he's, he's wanting these, these confirmations. He, he's, wanting, he's wanting to obey God, but it's, but it's hard. Can you relate to this at all? You, you know the command of God. You, you've, you've seen it. The word is very plain. This is what I ought to do. But I'm scared. Because if I do this, what might the consequences be? And, and we see pretty quickly with Gideon, it's not just a, a made-up fear. It's not a baseless fear. The very next morning, they're calling for his head, literally. So it's, it's not something that he's just made up. But his, his both those faltering steps of faith, and we see that God meets him there. Sometimes we, we often sit and think, well, if I just, I'll pray, and, and, and once God gives me the courage, then I'll be obedient. Gideon's helpful to remind us, sometimes courage follows obedience. In fact, sometimes obedience is the very means of stirring up our courage. To step forward with what we know to do, God has not promised to us, nor does he owe us the answers to all of our questions in advance. That's one of the running themes we've seen so far among the judges. There's much that we don't know, much we would like to know. Once again, in our confession of faith, there's, there's a, a wonderful statement about the nature of saving faith, true faith, and yet an acknowledgement that sometimes that true faith is very, very weak. The first two paragraphs in that chapter on saving faith define what saving faith is, what it is not, and then in paragraph three, we get, I think this is encouraging, and I hope you will be encouraged as well. This faith, this true saving faith, although it be different in stages and may be weak or strong, yet it is in the least degree of it different in the kind or nature of it as is all other saving grace from the faith and common grace of temporary believers. 
And therefore, though it may be many times assailed and weakened, yet it gets the victory. Growing up in many to the attainment of full assurance through Christ, who is both the author and finisher of our faith. Gideon's faith was weak faith. But we can turn again to Hebrews chapter 11 and know it was true faith. And here, it was a faith that only allowed him to go under the cover of darkness and do what God commanded him to do. Obedience was essential. Heroism was optional. But notice here, this confrontation is is a cosmic confrontation that in, in, in the eyes of heaven... There's no contest here. Baal is a false god. He doesn't exist. He can't speak. He can't hear. He can't act. But the Canaanites worshipped him. And the Israelites had joined in that worship. And here you, you have put on display the inferiority, the nothingness of Baal. And, and even in the exchange with Gideon's daddy, who comes out the next morning and says, will you contend for Baal? Will you save him? If he is a god, let him contend for himself because someone has torn down his altar. Gideon destroyed the altar. The the Asherah would have been kind of like a, you've seen the, the, the old Native American totem poles. It would have been similar to that. And Gideon was told not only to cut it down, but to cut it up, use it as firewood to offer the ox as a burnt offering. And that's what Gideon did. So when they got up the next morning, the altar's destroyed. The Asherah is burnt up. And Joash says, if, if Baal's really a god, he ought to be able to take care of this. He ought to be able to act in his own defense. Because we see that Yahweh certainly does. The confrontation here was ultimately Yahweh versus Baal. And so when we get to the section about the fleece, this makes more sense because we can sometimes be too easily distracted with with seeking god's god's secret will and neglect the bigger issue and sometimes i've heard sermons you probably have too about you ought to lay a fleece out you ought to test god you ought to ask for a sign and confirm that god's will is before you and that's not at all the case and we find very little in the book of judges that we ought to commend and imitate or to see as normative for the christian life and certainly not putting out a fleece. But here's what's, what's interesting. As we've talked before in, in some of the previous judges, Baal was worshipped as the god of the storm, the god of weather, the god of the harvests. So it is not just a random test that Gideon asks for. He asks, and essentially, are you really more powerful than Baal when it comes to the natural forces. I mean, can I see this clearly with my own eyes? So he puts out the fleece and say, if the ground is dry, but the fleece is wet, then I'll know. Of course, he comes in the next morning, he's able to wring wring a whole bowl of water out from the fleece. But then he's thinking, well, I mean, the laws of physics being what they are, um, that wool really sucks up the moisture in the air. Have you ever had one of those car wash mitts you put in your hand, it's all the lamb's wool, and it just holds four gallons of water in your own hand. So he's thinking, yeah, maybe that's, maybe I should have asked the other way around. But Gideon knows, Gideon knows that he's on thin ice. He knows that he should not be pressing this. He knows his faith is weak. Even the way he speaks to God, God, don't let your anger burn against me. Can I ask for one more? And he asks for the reverse. Can can we make it where where the whole ground is wet, but the fleece is dry? See, that would really be contrary to what normally happens with wool. George Schwab makes this comment. He says, what follows are two miraculous events, each involving dew. This is important since Israel had been looking for Baal for life-giving rain. Baal's specialty was precipitation, including condensation. One of his daughters was even named Dewey. To disgrace Baal, Elijah would declare to Ahab, there shall be neither dew nor rain. 1 Corinthians 17, saying, God will withhold rain that even Baal can't make. If Baal is a god, let him contend for himself, Gideon's father says. Deborah sang a song of Yahweh's ruling the storm. 
Now a final pair of signs clinch Yahweh's power in Baal's sphere. Yahweh is sovereign even over the dew. Gideon can march forward having been shown that Baal is nothing and Yahweh is everything. See, the fleece wasn't a random test. Gideon had a specific question in mind. See, the Canaanites, all our neighbors tell us that this whole precipitation thing, that that's really Baal's domain. Can you prove it's not? Can you prove you are indeed Lord of all things? Now, I want you to take note here of the great kindness and patience of Yahweh. As I pointed out, verse 39 is clear. Gideon knows that he is, he's deserving of God's anger here because of his faithlessness, because of his weak faith. God would be just in being angry with him. But notice God's response. And God did so that night. Notice how kind and gentle God is with Gideon to meet him at his weakness. Have you ever felt this way? You, you know God's word says to do something. You believe it's true, and, and yet you're fearful to move forward because you imagine in your mind, you've got all kinds of consequences that are going to lay out before you. What about this? What about this? What about this? If I do the right thing, I might get fired. I might lose this relationship. I might offend this person. I might be a social pariah. Your faith is weak, and perhaps like Gideon, you think God will be angry with you if you admit that you're weak. And we forget that God has said his strength is perfected in our weakness. God remembers our frame. He knows that we are but dust. Behold the patience and gentleness and mercy of Gideon's God. And if you are in Christ, this is your God. This is how he responds to your weaknesses. This is how he responds to your weak faith. This is how he responds to, to your needs. Beloved, you, your God and Savior remembers your frame. He knows you are but dust. And he knows Jesus Christ exhibited and displayed perfect, unwavering faith in his Father because he knew we couldn't and we wouldn't. He displayed a perfect faith on your behalf if you are in him. All of his perfection has been imputed to you by faith if you are in Christ. And especially now, those of us who have the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we know that it is precisely in our weakness and our humility that God comes to us. God, in through his Son, has extended his golden scepter and bid us to come into his presence. He says, bring your weak faith right here before my throne. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me who are weak, and I will meet you gently. Dale Davis, once again, he says, granted, Gideon's is a unique situation. Yet there is, I think, a theological spillover from this text for all God's flock. God is not ashamed to stoop down and reassure us in our fears. He is patient with our weakness. God doesn't mind humbling himself in order to bolster our fragile faith, our wavering grip on his word. He is so eager to do just that, listen to this, that he has provided a table instead of a threshing floor. God has provided for us bread and wine in place of a fleece. As we come in a moment to the Lord's Supper, come with your weak faith. Come with your fears. Come with your sorrows. Come with those things that, that are weighing upon you where you know, this is I have a decision to make. I have things that I need to do. And I'm fearful how it's going to turn out. I'm fearful what's going to happen if I obey God. What's going to happen if I hear his voice and dare to believe him? What happens if maybe for the first time in your life you let go of your own self-righteousness and humble yourself today before the cross of Christ? What will happen to you? 
If you say to yourself and confess to God, I am a sinner worthy of your judgment and your wrath for all of eternity, and I have no way to fix myself, I've tried everything. What happens if you let go of that? Say, I come to Christ. That's all I have. That's all I need. He is more than enough to wash me and cleanse me and preserve me for all of eternity. Saints, will you be encouraged today, any day, in which your faith falters? As Christ, as Jesus Christ himself, the perfect prophet, speaks to you today through his word, will you fix your eyes upon him, believing that even your idolatry, even, even your sinful fear, even your weakness of faith, your fear of man, all of those things, none of those things are able to separate you from him. You believe that it is his strength that causes you to persevere, not yours? Will you accept today this divine confrontation? Receive that as a mercy of God. Will you look with even those faltering steps of faith and seek to walk in obedience and trust that, that he will give you what you need to take the next step? Take the first step and believe that he will give you the next one. Let's pray and ask for his spirit to, to remain with us and to help us to receive and obey his word. Father, you are an awesome God. Thank you that you continue, that, that, that Gideon was not the last one that you confronted. Thank you that your word abides in us, that your spirit dwells within us, and that Christ, our perfect prophet, continues to confront us with your word, to press upon us that which we either cannot see or refuse to see. Lord, will you humble us before you? Grant to your people an increased faith. Take our weak and feeble faith and cause it to grow. Cause it to endure. Cause it to, to, to express upon our lips a praise to our triune God. Cause that faith to express from our hearts and our lips our love for one another. Help us to walk by that faith and not by sight. Amen.